Simulacra and Simulation is a book written by the French philosopher Jean Baudrillard and published in 1981. It is primarily concerned with the role that images play in contemporary society and the way that reality is mediated by these images. Baudrillard introduces the concept of the hyperreal, illustrating it through references to a wide range of cultural products, from advertising and architecture to cinema and universities. This is a series of notes and reflections that I compiled while reading the book. Baudrillard opens with a supposed quote from the Ecclesiastes. The simulacrum is never what hides the truth. It is the truth that hides the fact that there is none. The simulacrum is true. End quote. He then proceeds to describe a great empire, which, as its territory expanded, devised a map which was so precise in scale and detail that it eventually becomes confused for the actual geography it was only meant to represent. In other words, the map became the empire. Baudrillard argues that today, such simulations have escalated to a point where they now compose our understanding of reality. He calls this the hyperreal, a representation so realistic that it cannot be distinguished as a representation, but is treated as reality. In order to illustrate the difficulty of determining the real from the simulated, he offers the example of illness. A truly ill person may simply lie in bed, not exhibiting any symptoms, while a pretender may purposefully exhibit the symptoms by which the doctors would diagnose or treat the illness. What can we make of a person who truly believes themselves to be ill, or has been convinced of their illness, or the person whose symptoms vanish after being given a placebo? Is there a difference? He expands his observation with cases from theology and ethnology. For example, can divinity be represented in an image? This concept was resisted by iconoclasts because it threatened to limit and substitute the divine and ultimately imply that there is no God, that only the image itself exists, with nothing behind it. He then addresses the imaginary, popular theme parks such as Disneyland. He claims that this is an example of heightened simulation that works to distract society from the imperceptible simulations which constitute the world beyond the park's colourful, glossy walls. Baudrillard delineates the order of symbols into four successive phases. 1. Reflection This symbol is a good appearance or faithful copy. 2. Mask This symbol is a perverted appearance or an unfaithful copy. 3. Illusion. This is a cover-up, pretending to be a faithful copy. And four, pure simulacrum. This has no relation to reality whatsoever. He then turns to the simulations of television, citing the 1971 series The Loud Family, which documented the daily life of an American family for a national audience of 20 million viewers. He refers to the series as Television Verité, which is French for truth or reality. It was an early example of reality television that 21st century viewers are now saturated with. He is quick to label the show's claim to reality as absurd, since the presence of cameras undoubtedly shaped family members' behaviour and actions. He then argues that television shouldn't be thought of simply as a cause that affects us, since we affect it. Thus, television and viewers form part of the same DNA structure. We model ourselves after it, and it models itself after us, gradually forming a hyper-reality. Next, Baudrillard discusses the Cold War, arguing that the threat of total destruction excludes conflict and revolution, and installs in its place an implacable system of regulations and deterrence. The space and nuclear arms races are not leading anywhere, he claims, but are instead the indefinite honing of operations and security. 
It was not walking on the moon that inspired awe, but the awesome level of control exhibited by the system. He describes deterrence not as a strategy, but a circulation, like capital floating free of production. He further argues that victory and defeat no longer mean anything, except in the simulatory narrative of the media. This is demonstrated in the fact that North Vietnam triumphed in its war and was still able to enter into a stable coexistence with America and China. Baudrillard dedicates a chapter to the 1970 miniseries Holocaust, arguing that the trauma of extermination is not merely forgotten, but was replaced with artificial, mediated memories of history. He claims that the series is an example of reheating a past event, not so that it may be remembered and understood, but so that it can be used as another aspect of deterrence, transmitted through the cold medium of television. He describes cinema, the phantasm, the mirror, the spectacle, as being gradually contaminated by television, the magnetic tape, the endless feedback loop, the pervasive drone of mass media. Though I would dispute the claim that cinema was ever truly divorced from the commercial and systematized modes of television, or that television has not matured as an art form since the 1970s, both in aesthetic and discourse. He dedicates another chapter to the film The China Syndrome, a thriller which tells the story of a television reporter who discovers safety cover-ups at a nuclear power plant. Baudrillard locates the film in the historical context of Watergate, which was an illicit government cover-up which preceded the film, the release of Network, which was a satirical film about the amoral quest for ratings and the fabrication of truth in a TV network, and Harrisburg, which was an incident at an American nuclear power plant which occurred shortly after the film. It is unclear to what extent simulation precedes the real, and thus whether history has already been written. Baudrillard groups these events into what he calls the China Syndrome Trilogy, and evaluates them as the hot nuclear spectacle being distilled and dispersed through the cold war system of information networks. People are kept in a state of alertness for an event which is never supposed to occur, but which must be deterred through omnipotent control and security. He concludes with a critique of terrorism being an attempt to force the event, to rupture or make hot the system, and thus free people or force a confrontation with the real. Baudrillard also offers some thoughts on the film Apocalypse Now, arguing that it did not merely depict the Vietnam War, but was made of the Vietnam War. The director, Francis Ford Coppola, plunged his cast and crew into a notoriously nightmarish production, which threatened the lives and sanity of all involved, and produced images which aspired to the excess and immoderation of American intervention. Mass media replaces the memories and history it sought to represent, effectively becoming reality. Baudrillard writes, quote, Film becomes war, the two united by their shared overflowing of technology. End quote. He then turns his attention to French architecture, specifically the Beaubourg Center in Paris, which was constructed in the 1970s and houses the largest museum of modern art in Europe, as well as other research institutions. He labels this building a, quote, monument of cultural deterrence, which functions as an incinerator absorbing all the cultural energy and devouring it, end quote. I wasn't quite sure why this building in particular was so offensive to Baudrillard, but it may have something to do with its attempt to mediate culture into a consumerist model, its failure to resist the hyperreality, its potential to indoctrinate the masses with a simulation of authorized culture which replaces actual culture, or which prolongs the death of culture, possibly. Who knows? In any event, he argues that we are in the midst of an implosion, which we are only gradually becoming aware of a collapse of structures. He calls the student protests of 1968 the first episode of this implosion. 
quote, a first violent reaction to the saturation of the social, a retraction, a challenge to the hegemony of the social, end quote. He makes it clear that this implosion is not necessarily negative, but that it is incalculable to the current systems of reasoning. Bergelard debates the impact of mass media on people, particularly advertising, which he argues manipulates and tests its audience. Products no longer possess function, no longer serve us, but rather, we serve them. He equates billboards with surveillance cameras in that they watch us, but also reflects a commercially idealized version of us, which we have yet to achieve. He makes reference to something called the hypermarket, which signals the end of modernity. In the global neoliberal economy, modern institutions dissolve and society is decentralized. That is, urban populations spread outwards indefinitely into new cities, subject to shopping centers rather than the city itself. Perhaps hypermarket simply refers to supermarkets and the transportation systems that feed in and out of them. He then ponders why meaning is being lost with the increase of information. He considers three possibilities. The flow of information has become too quick for meaning to be attached to it. Information is purely technical and operates outside of meaning. Information directly destroys meaning and signification. He favours the third option. Bergelard is very pessimistic of the media, arguing that the coverage of social movements by the media actually neutralises them, rather than strengthens them. This is because it creates a simplified representation which lacks the ability to transform or evolve. It degrades the event into a simulation of revolution, facilitates an artificial solidarity which we, the sympathetic spectator, mistake as real. Bergelard breaks simulacra down to three orders. One, natural, as in based on image, imitation and counterfeiting, with aims to optimistic ideals. Two, productive, as in based on energy and forced, materialized by machine, with aims to expand. And three, simulation, as in based on information, the model, cybernetic play, with aims to total control. He claims that the second order is expressed through traditional science fiction, for example, exploratory narratives by Jules Verne, H.G. Wells, and perhaps even series like Star Trek. But the third order has yet to develop a corresponding literary form. He does, however, cite the 1973 novel and 1996 film, Crash, as potentially embodying a simulation sci-fi. This assertion confused me, since there doesn't seem to be anything particularly speculative or futuristic about Crash's narrative. I wondered if perhaps the novel or film depicted a sort of dystopian vision of contemporary society, in which human consciousness was violently merged with machine, human form reduced to and fetishized as parts, human sexuality mechanized, deconstructed, and rebuilt, and thus the text may share themes with post-human science fiction. Such a reading coheres with Baudrillard's implosive critique of 20th century society, and subverts the expanding slash explosive model of traditional science fiction. Baudrillard assumes that science fiction is an extension of reality, but argues that in blurring the line between reality and imagination, globalization restricts the scope of imagination. That is, if everything has been explored or described or systematized, then science fiction has nowhere else to go. But the question is, does this assumption bear out after Simulacra and Simulation's publication? The cyberpunk fiction of William Gibson, which Baudrillard may not have encountered, is probably a more evocative example of the Third Order, as it depicts what Patrick Nagel describes as, quote, vast global networks of information, exchange and control, creates a postmodern pastiche of different cultures and beliefs, and constantly questions the shifting nature of identity, end quote. Arguably, turn-of-the-century films like The Truman Show, The Matrix, and Minority Report combine the second and third orders of simulacra. 
Bertrelard acknowledges the possibility of this contamination. For example, the information model of the computer may very well function through the productive power of the machine, a notion dramatized through the sinister artificial intelligence of films like 2001 A Space Odyssey and The Terminator. These depict systems that revolt against themselves. He concludes that the operatic qualities of the first order, the operative qualities of the second order, and the operational qualities of the third order may produce all kinds of interferences. Bergelard addresses the question of animals, claiming that we respect the inhuman less than ever before. Our tendency to sentimentalize animals denies the reality of the natural world and reduces them to commodities to be used as comfort items, anthropomorphs, objects of charity, or pre-processed meat. He claims that the ritual sacrifice and archaic butchery practiced by past civilizations were more respectful of animals because they at least acknowledged the animal had being and worth outside of human interest, and that this worth was being deliberately repurposed or transformed. I wasn't entirely sure if I agreed with this claim, but acknowledged that there was a conceptual difference between an animal killed to fill the plate of its killer, or the killer's family slash community, and a thousand animals killed by a factory to fill refrigerators and supermarket shelves. Essentially, Baudrillard seems to object to the human tendency to speak on behalf of animals, since it forces them to assimilate into human systems of meaning and hegemony. He reflects that this dynamic is comparable to colonial powers' insistence that indigenous people, non-European ethnicities, the physically or mentally disabled, and children be made to speak on their terms, or the presumption of these powers that they knew how best to take care of them. Baudrillard brings up the 1993 film King Kong as an example of the animal rejecting its status as a commodity and reclaiming its mythological status as monstrous other. The great ape is brought to the modern world in chains, evidence of the subjugation of nature or the infantilization of the native, only for it to break free and sack the industrial metropolis that denied it, to liberate the viewer from our modernist cage. Bertrelad notes the relationship between King Kong and the heroine implies the possibility of animal-human seduction. Meaning is inverted as the human characters behave inhumanely and the beast is humanized, first by its betrayal and then by its righteous anger. Towards the end of the book, Baudrillard delves into the psychoanalytic. Quote, Animals have no unconscious because they have territory. Men only had it unconscious since they lost the territory. End quote. That is to say, even at our most primitive Humanity was nomadic, exploring, without a natural environment. In contrast, animals have an environment that they are shaped for and that is shaped for them, and thus lack an internal interruption, even if they have to endure the ceaseless external interruptions of humans. Una Chaturi suggests that this binary between territory and unconscious echoes Baudrillard's opening binary of the imperial territory and the map that eclipses it. The question is, does this then suggest that the unconscious is a simulacra of the territory we have lost and have never been able to regain? Baudrillard disputes the conventional wisdom that when everything is taken away, nothing is left. Because theory cannot accept the existence of a remainder, as in meaningless and insignificant byproducts, it cannot be subtracted from the whole. I found this claim a little confusing, and Baudrillard spends several pages trying to explain the concept of the remainder using various analogies. One thing he maintains is that, unlike other concepts, such as left and right, majority and minority, the remainder has no binary opposition. I wondered if this might refer to things that are unexplained, unincorporated, or denied by modern systems, such as the unconscious or the primordial. Regressed, these things gain power outside the limits of the system, eventually growing into the dark mirror of the social. Thus, the remainder is an excess, 
an infinite production of leftovers, leftovers, rather than a lack. Within the framework of the simulacra, one can't help but wonder whether society is the original or the byproduct. To put it another way, does our shadow fall from us, or did we emerge from it? Baudrillard obviously doesn't give us a clear answer. Instead, he mounts a scathing assessment of higher education as non-functional, lacking in cultural substance, and having no purpose of knowledge. He claims that the May 1968 protest featured students tearing apart the architecture of French academic centres in order to expose academia to its own rotting corpse. He likens these social ruptures to the American riots in Watts and Detroit, in which African Americans brandished the ruins of their neighbourhood to highlight its neglect. Baudrillard's ire seems to stem from higher education's role in perpetuating the simulation rather than confronting it, in providing diplomas in return for currency rather than work. It is akin to paper being traded for paper, floating together in a Mobius strip. The arrangement is maintained because it is beneficial for the institutions, the teachers, and the students. However, it is in a state of perpetual entropy, of cooling down. The more people who have academic credentials, the less meaning academia will have. It is especially disappointing because, as Michael Payne points out, decades prior, universities seem like, quote, laboratories for new social and political values, end quote. But now, according to Baudrillard, they have been subsumed by the indifference and empty values of the culture. Baudrillard ends his book by offering a postmodern viewpoint on nihilism. He describes this third wave of nihilism in terms of transparency and irresolution, contrasting it with the political dimensions of romantic nihilism and the aesthetic dimensions of surrealist nihilism. Contemporary nihilism, he claims, is politically and aesthetically neutral, engendering not examination, but indifference, existing not through destruction, but simulation. Baudrillard admits that he cannot find meaning in the world, that he too has been made inert by the overdose of images, and thus considers himself a nihilist. Even if the divine does not exist, it is surely rendered inaccessible behind the labyrinth of divine images. He claims that hyperreality is immune to critical theory because it is itself nihilistic, completely indifferent and without ideology. Baudrillard seems to end by abandoning academia in favor of something more radical. He writes, quote, Theoretical violence, not truth, is the only recourse left us, end quote. Yet he even regards this call to arms as utopian, for we no longer have a real stage to act out the struggle.